Hey everyone, welcome to the Get Your Life Together Girl podcast, the ultimate blueprint of self-love and inner peace. I'm your host, Danielle Van. As a cognitive behavioral therapist, a life coach, meditation teacher, and author, I've spent my life studying and learning from the stories that make us human. It's my passion and goal to help you shift your mindset and create a lifelong revolution to help you reach your greatest potential. Let me ask you, how was your childhood? Ugh. Half of the people listening just said good and the other half just shuddered. The idea of a perfect parent or the perfect family is honestly a myth. As humans, we are all flawed to some degree. Yet when we grow up in households that can be deemed dysfunctional, the emotional, mental, and even physical impact on our adulthood can really screw us in ways we haven't even realized yet. So today, you and I are taking a one-on-one deep dive into the lasting and profound effects of dysfunction and how it may still be impacting your life now through the behaviors that you use to show up into the world. And we'll talk about how you can begin the inner journey to releasing what is no longer serving you. Let's get right to it. The Get Your Life Together Girl podcast starts right now. Okay trigger warning all through this conversation. This is a difficult conversation, a place that may feel a little rattling to some, but we have to talk about the realities that we live in and how we are showing up as grown-ups, especially if we have had emotionally immature parents, if we're still enmeshed in a family that has no boundaries or We live in a space where what happens on the outside really impacts the inside. It goes without saying that all of us have experiences in our childhood that still impact us now, right? That happens. It's just the ups and downs of living of our humanness. But what we're talking about today is really growing up in a space where we're in a cycle of dysfunction and that cycle has continued regardless if we have changed the way that we show up in the world. So we want to really talk about what a dysfunctional family is, what it feels like, and how it has impacted us both short-term and long-term. And then we want to really dive into how we change the rhythm of that dysfunction of the behaviors. You know, I know that a lot of people when they enter into therapy will say to me, I do not want to talk about my childhood. And we will begin to talk about whatever is impacting them currently that brought them to the table to begin with. And as we weave through things on their own, they will often really uncover the fact that, oh wait, this is a behavior of mine, or I am responding this way because of X, Y, and Z that happened before. And it's then that they realize that if they want to change the state or the nature in which they show up to the world, they also have to look at the history of their behavior, why they do what they do, how it impacts them. The only way that we shift our reality is to look at what caused the reality to begin with. This is a conversation that may feel a little heated. It's something that I'm very passionate about. It's a place that we want to really look at how can we get into a space that we no longer feel unloved, unprotected, unfed, unemotionally attached, where there's no more chaos in our mindset, where the unpredictability or the instability or even the unhealthiness of our childhood, of our parents, of our siblings, of just our environment has the power to change. It is truly a life experience that opens the door for us, but we must first look at the impacts, okay? And so again, trigger warning, something that I say here may actually feel like a bomb being dropped in your lap, And of course, that's not the intention, nor is it to diagnose you with anything. It's more about looking at the long lasting impacts that you have experienced that has moved into your adulthood that now has the ability to be transformed, changed, uplifted, and let go of 
so that you can get into a space of living your highest and best life, of getting your life together. So let's talk about first what a dysfunctional family is, what it feels like. It's probably easiest to give you sort of the standard (laughs) that children learn or you now realize that you have learned. And it's not so much the definition, but instead the behavior. And so most kids in dysfunctional families learn, don't trust, don't talk, and don't feel. Many times in therapy, we have to teach people to trust for the first time because for so long, they knew not to express their feelings, that they can't be honest, that they have to keep themselves small, that if we want to be confident, we have to do it in a certain way. And so we get into a space where we survive, right? That's a very big hallmark of dysfunctional families, really, is that you're usually in survival roles where you take over responsibility for other things in your life. You become the scapegoat where you will, you know, take on negative behaviors of other people. There's people pleasing. There's feeling shy and withdrawn, never feeling like you're seen and heard, major control issues. And this is sort of the hallmark of dysfunctional families. And before we go any deeper into that, a lot of times when we begin to go down this pathway, I am asked a very standard question and I wanna share the question and the response. It helps us sort of, you know, have a ruler for where we fall in the terms of functional family versus dysfunctional family. So the question often is, what does a functional family look like. Understanding this helps us break down whether or not we dealt with a dysfunctional family. And of course, I want to put this out there. A well-functioning family isn't without some hiccups. It's the fact that their family, their experiences, all of these things don't lead to breakdowns or abuse or feeling like you have to hide all of the things that we're going to talk about. So, According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, a functional family is a group of people related that enjoy spending time together despite the daily stresses and responsibilities. There are clearly defined rules and roles. Every member of the family has the rules. They understand what they are. They understand that this is a critical function of the family and that there's some flexibility there. So that way we know where our boundaries are and what we can and cannot do. A healthy family embraces mutual respect, meaning that the adults are respected for their role, but the children also have respect as individuals, that their personalities, their desires are allowed to be spoken about, that they're treated with equality and that they're not made to compete against anyone else in the family unit. A healthy family doesn't have abuse or neglect, right? That everybody has a role and responsibility and the family itself feels safe. It's a space that psychologically, physically, emotionally, mentally, all the things, there is safety. A healthy family actually engages in healthy conflict. Conflict is a part of a functional family, right? We're going to have spaces and times where we get angry, where we get pissed off, where we have things that we want to be dealt with immediately. And in a healthy family, we know that it's okay to express ourselves, that we're not shamed for the conflict that's created. And we're allowed to have the appropriate emotion in the mix of everything that's happening. And then we are celebrated for our individual differences. These set of things are important standards when we talk about a functional family. Now let's get into the traits of the dysfunctional family now that you have something to weigh it by. That doesn't mean that everything that is said here is going to happen in every family. 
we're looking at some of the contributing factors that lead to dysfunction. A dysfunctional family doesn't allow individual members to express their emotions or their needs. And there is this overwhelming sense of tension within the family. Families can be dysfunctional for so many different reasons. And I want to say this too, it doesn't always have to come from the parents. Sometimes one of the children has emotional or behavioral difficulties and the family begins to evolve around this one child and the family becomes off balanced and the dysfunction begins. So that's important to know too. It's not always the parents, sometimes it's the kids, but the traits that we're looking at, again, not all of them have to be present. One or both parents live with substance abuse have mental health conditions, or they're prevented from parenting in a healthy way. It can also be where parents are absent. And so children are left to fend for themselves. We have abandonment issues, all of the things. We're going to talk about that in just a bit. Dysfunction comes when children are required to be parents and they take on too many responsibilities. That can even happen if there's a sick parent where the kids are having to step up and do all of the work. That can become very dysfunctional. Of course, there's things like sexual abuse or violence in the household that of course is going to lead to chaos and neglect. No boundaries or rules within the family can absolutely lead into a space of dysfunction where there's no love or affection between family members. This can also be cultural, but when we have no ability to emotionally express, or we don't know that we're wanted and needed, we can live in dysfunction. When family members evade each other's personal space and privacy without consent, like reading through their phones, reading through journals, not communicating, not allowing the boundaries to be present, we can get into a space of dysfunction. Where children are used as weapons or pawns against the other parent, that obviously is a space of major dysfunction. Where parents expect perfection of their children, dysfunction. Where there's no flexibility and there's situations where there is no space to mess up where there is a reality shifting meaning that your parents contradict everything you think and do and tell you what you feel, that can lead into a space of emotional neglect, where there's excess demands placed on certain time and friends and behaviors, and yet there's no guideline or real structure where there is this feeling of constantly being belittled, controlled, lied to, where affection is only given when you do something to a certain standard and that expectation is met. It can even be where we don't even feel comfortable in our own household, where we are forced to take sides in parent conflict where there's inappropriate behavior by the parent. And these are all things that can cause this feeling of being unwanted and unloved and unprotected and living in this constant space of survival that I talked about in the very beginning. Everything that I just mentioned really forces a child to step up and create a sense of control this survival and coping mechanisms and skills that help us embrace some form of emotional stability that really doesn't have a background of love and protection behind it. There's no safety in the behaviors, no safety in the way that we show up. And when we grow up like this, we continue to move forward without realizing that all of those things or, you know, a handful of those things create certain things in us that we take into our maturity. The set of behaviors that I'm about to hand over again, like everything, can be connected to other things other than a neglectful family or dysfunctional family, right? Either way. But let's talk about the impact of an upbringing such as this and 
These are not in any particular order. I'm just throwing them out as they come. And the first one that comes up that I see so often is the lack of safety and therefore having major trust issues. Children raised in dysfunctional families often struggle with trust because they do not feel safe. When a parent or a family really fails to keep their promises or they are unpredictable, we have all kinds of ups and downs. It erodes the ability to trust. And that is carried forth from the time that it starts until we identify that it's a problem and we begin to work on the healing process. Think about this. If you don't feel safe, you're less likely to engage in solid relationships. You're much more likely to put up walls, evade positive reinforcement in your life. You usually seek validation for safety and that can turn into people pleasing and and different elements there. But trust issues is a major factor of dealing with an instability in your childhood. Let's go to the next one. There's a lot of these, so we're going to move through them quickly. Again, we're not trying to diagnose. What we're trying to do is identify some of the things that may be showing up for you that you need to address if you want to get to that next step in your life. So number two. Most people that grow up in dysfunctional families learn to hide and lie. Very interesting, but think about this. In an environment that's filled with turmoil, lying becomes a safety mechanism and a coping mechanism. These are two different things. So safety mechanism is something that you use to keep yourself in a state of safety. Lying, okay? then coping mechanism is safety has already been eroded. It's not there. It's not a part of the experience. And therefore I'm trying to do something to make me feel safe. Okay. Those are two very different things, but lying becomes the coping mechanism to try to get us back into safety. We tend to lie in order to mitigate reactions. We have fear that something may happen, that something may actually intervene with our standard lifestyle. And we put up walls and barriers and lie in hopes that the don't ask, don't tell environment keeps us safe. It is a hard fact. It's something as an adult that's going to kill your professional career. It's going to kill your relationships. It's going to give you a facade of connectivity that's based on zero foundation. Let's talk about the next one, poor communication skills. Those are very tied together, right? Learning to lie and poor communication skills. Dysfunctional families address nothing generally, right? They avoid issues. They have zero ability to emotionally connect and they don't want to. And therefore we have poor ability to connect through verbals, through communication. Parents involved, especially like in drugs or illegal activities, they're not going to open up to their children and they're certainly not going to want to know their children's feelings about what they're doing. Again, that whole don't ask, don't tell environment impacts your ability to express yourself effectively. This next one is something that I see so often and it's this feeling of isolation. In adults, that looks like I am never heard. No one ever hears me. No one ever listens to me. I hear this so often. And even if you try to express to someone, I'm hearing you, I'm validating your feelings, they still push so hard and usually in a very nasty way, in a way that pushes people away. And they want to stay in that isolation because it feels the safest. But those that came from dysfunctional families often feel isolated, even in a big crowd, even in their own family that they've created. And the reason why is they're so used to a lack of emotional support and zero open communication that when they try to engage in that way, it feels very disjointed. And so there's the disconnection and the loneliness that is coupled together. And that feels very circular. It feels very isolating, a bubble that no one can crack. And if you try, they fight. So this is a big, big thing that we have to look for. 
in adulthood, a lot of people will say they just aren't good friends. They, they don't like having a lot of people around. And that's sort of the way of saying, hey, they have some emotional disconnection and they put up walls and it's just hard to engage with them. Next is approval seeking. Growing up in an unstable environment is going to ask you to constantly be desperate for approval, outside validation. What we do then is compare ourselves. We need the new car. We need the biggest and best of everything. We need the job and the clothes and all the things in order to have the approval that we did not get. We constantly begin to strive to please others because there's a fear of rejection. We don't want to be abandoned. We feel like if you give us that look, that feeling, that emotional support, that yes, that we're looking for, that we have a place in your life, and it becomes a very toxic environment for most adults. Another thing that is so prevalent in those who grew up in dysfunction is anxiety. The other piece to that is intimidation. These two go hand in hand. Dysfunctional families can often create an environment of anxiety and intimidation, and that is very particularly found when somebody tries to help you as an adult. <laughs> okay, see this all the time. Generalized anxiety is one thing, but when we have anxiety around certain people or unpredictable reactions from somebody that we want to have a reaction from, these two pieces fight each other. That generally transfers into the next thing, which is feelings of guilt, hopelessness, helplessness. Witnessing high levels of conflict, abuse, neglect is going to lead to feeling overwhelmed, right? And that overwhelm leads us into guilt. These emotions persist. We begin to feel bad about the way we feel. We try to show up and do the good thing for other people, and then it doesn't work for us sometimes. And then we become, you know, engaged in this cycle of what is wrong with me? Nothing ever works. People never listen to me. I'm always hurt. It's this feeling that you can't do anything right. And no matter what you do, it always ends the same. Then let's talk about the challenges that we see with intimacy. Dysfunctional families can hinder the development of healthy intimacy. Trust issues, emotional scars make it extremely difficult to let people in. And if there has been any break whatsoever in the relationship where there's trust or safety that has been questioned, guess what? This is the first thing that goes. Then of course, we see substance and addiction we are exposed to this whenever we are trying to look for a way to cope with the experiences, the ability to, you know, downgrade the emotional response is so necessary. And that's on a high level, right? We also have to talk about how extremely hard we are on ourselves as adults because of the dysfunction. Dysfunctional families tend to lean into low self-worth or negative thought patterns, such as thinking that, you know, you're really awful, you're not lovable. It's this rigid thinking of yourself and others because you perhaps had an overcritical parent. It's this space where we have to learn to turn off the voices in our heads, but it's extremely hard. Those that grow up in dysfunction are extremely hard on themselves. It's just the way that it is. Sometimes we can turn it into motivation. Sometimes it turns into toxic motivation. But most of the time, it's that inner voice that beats the hell out of us and takes us down no matter what we're doing or how we're trying to show up. There's just a few other things I want to touch on before we move into how to get rid of these things. But let's look at the next one that is so important to talk about, which is struggling to regulate your emotions. Emotional dysregulation will always occur if dysfunction is a part of your life. Early on, you are taught how to feel 
And early on, when you have been told that it's not okay to cry, it's not okay to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations, it's not okay to allow yourself to express anything other than silence or numbness, we're going to have a really hard time regulating the emotional body. And so if you grew up in this situation or your parents were really emotionally immature or abusive, you're likely used to bottling up your emotions. You're likely used to shutting other people down when they tried to emotionally connect too. This is a really hard thing to deal with. It is something that will stun a lot of people. It ruins relationships, but it comes back to what was showing up for you when you were younger. Of course, then there is that insecure attachment style where even if you know your family was dysfunctional and you want the opposite, it's extremely hard to go to the opposite. It's common to have difficulties in friendships and romantic partnerships and even work relationships because you don't set boundaries, you don't communicate your feelings, or you don't even know what healthy looks like. And so if you struggle with finding or forming or keeping healthy, secure relationships, you need to look at your attachment style. There's really four bonds that we all have. It's secure, anxious, avoidant, or disorganized. The last three are generally caused by growing up in a dysfunctional family. The wonderful thing is, is that you can change that as an adult. We're going to talk about that in just a second. The next one is you have no idea, no ability to navigate conflict. Very important. If you grew up with a reactive parent who raged at the first sign of, you know, emotional disruption, who withdrew their love, you probably learned that conflict is not safe. Right. But on the flip side, if you grew up with a passive parent who shut down any time that uncomfortable feelings came up, you probably figured out real quickly that you needed to swallow your feelings in order to keep the peace. Right. Our parents are our model, whether they realize it or not, or they want to be or not. That's what happens. We learn from the environment. So if you don't know how to navigate conflict, it scares you. You'll do anything to avoid it. You have to look at what did you learn? Why did you learn that? And is it something that you want to change? The next is you're afraid of uncertainty. We go back to anxiety, right? Because anxiety is trying to have all the information, trying to get to a certain you know, outcome without having all the information. And uncertainty makes us really freaking uncomfortable, right? If you have a history of child abuse or neglect, you probably are more risk adverse, meaning you don't want to do anything to step out of your comfort zone. And so that makes uncertainty really something scary. A large portion of people who come from dysfunctional family systems do not feel okay to step outside of the comfort zone. We don't know what it looks like if we fall. We have a hard time pivoting. We don't want to have that feeling of discomfort. So we'll take the comfort, even though it's generally not safest for us, and deal so that we don't have to put ourselves onto a different path. A lot of times that looks like staying in unhealthy relationships because it's just easier, right? We're just, we're together, we're bonded, it's fine. There's nothing productive or healthy really about the relationship, but we stay because the risk aversion is too high based on the predictability and the way that we're functioning within this relationship. It generally comes from the dysfunction. I just handed over a ton of things that happen in our behavior, in our feelings, when there has been a dysfunctional family. And again, not all of those have to be present, but many of the behaviors do show up because of the environment we grew up in. However, you do have the ability to minimize the impact of the dysfunction in your adulthood. It does take a forward movement to make the change. It does take courage 
it does take a willingness to do the hard work and be so damn uncomfortable that you're willing to step past the past, right? I'm willing to do the work because I'm tired of feeling like crap. I'm tired of feeling like this based on something that my parents did. I'm tired of feeling like this or doing this or ruining this relationship or not doing that because of something that happened 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 30 years ago. If we do not allow ourselves to navigate what has been and what it created within us, we never have the ability to fully get our lives together. And so this is the process that you can navigate to start. First and foremost, be willing to do the work. That's the first one. Seek someone like myself or all of the multiple thousands of fantastic therapists, psychotherapists, counselors, coaches who are trained in trauma, in dysfunction, in behavior to help you identify what it is that you're dealing with and how to best navigate it. If you don't have the ability to do that, if you don't want to work with someone directly and you want to do these things on your own, let's talk about those, right? Let's talk about change that is possible as long as you put the right resources in place. And basically what we're trying to do here is to put literal skill sets into your day-to-day that will help you know how to navigate your experiences and change how you are showing up. And so I'm going to give you sort of this framework that helps you do just that. There's about nine things that you can start trying right now. Again, these are on a low level because it is best to have somebody guide you through these things. But if, again, you can't, here's where to start. So the first one is to, again, give yourself permission and then acknowledge the impact. Big one. Recognize that your childhood experiences have shaped you, but they do not have to be your entire identity. Again, you are not your past and you do have the ability to create a different present and future. So acknowledge the impact. If you heard a ton of things that came up in the list of behaviors, write them down. Know what you are dealing with and then know that you have the ability to change it. We can't change anything that we will not witness. So acknowledge the impact. Then feel your feelings. Remember that emotions are messengers. Sit with the emotion and the sensation that the things on that list on the childhood scope brings up for you. Allow them to come to mind, allow them to bring all of the feelings forth and allow them to flow out of you. Don't try to change it. Don't try to hide from them. Don't try to do anything other than name them and observe them. Acknowledge the discomfort that you feel and know that if you sit with it long enough, it's going to move out of you. If you choose not to allow it to have a place in your mindset, it's not going to flow. It's not going to change. It's just going to sit and wait for the next time. So sit, feel your feelings, feel the essential message that's coming up and then decide what you want to do with it. In that, you're going to experience negatives. So challenge the hell out of them. Understand that the negativity is saying, I have a certain attachment to this event. I did not like the way this happened. I do not like the way that this makes me feel. And so reframe those beliefs. I've told this story before on the podcast, and I'm going to make it really brief. And again, this is one of those examples that is so low level. But I want you to think about the impact that something this small can have. When I was younger, we took family photos and my stepmom took it to her office and put the family photo on, you know, her shelf or whatever it was. And it was just my dad and her and myself. That's all. I'm the only child. And one of her coworkers came in who happened to be a good friend by that point and said, 
Well, you know, Danielle is really going to struggle with her weight. I think I was in middle school at this time, maybe sixth, seventh grade. I don't know. But I wasn't a heavy child by any means. It's not here nor there, really. But the woman that was actually making this sort of, we'll call it an allegation, that I was going to struggle with my weight was someone who did, who struggled with her weight the majority of time that my stepmom knew her. And this comment was sort of offhanded. You know, her experience was that she had large hands and therefore she connected that to her weight issue. Well, it was brought to me. It was said. It, of course, wasn't meant to be toxic, but it was still said. And I remember in multiple places of my life thinking, okay, you're not heavy because your hands aren't, you know, bloated or they're not this or they're not that. It's this feeling that really took me down sometimes. Oh, your hands are swollen. Therefore, you're going to get heavy. As adults, we have the ability to look at those examples and go, you know what, that was bullshit. That's so stupid. Really, why would someone even say that? But it takes a reframing of those beliefs, right? You're not just going to reach for, well, that was bullshit, if that's something that you continue to hold on to. So think about that. You know, an insult as a child doesn't have to define your worth as an adult, but it can. It absolutely can. So challenge the beliefs that come up for you. If you heard that list and all of these beliefs start flowing to your mind, you need to challenge those. That's big. And then I want you to set boundaries. Establishing boundaries with the people in your life that cause the toxic environment is necessary. A lot of times when I'm talking to people about setting boundaries with their family that caused a lot of negativity, they'll say, well, I can't do that. They're not going to respect my boundaries anyway. They're going to push even harder. It doesn't matter. And I have to tell you, establishing boundaries with anyone for anything is necessary. It is a form of self-safety. And you have the right to protect yourself from any toxic environment. It's okay. Boundaries do not have to be a wall. They're not about other people. They're about you. What am I willing to accept? What am I willing to take on because of your behavior? I don't have to connect to the things that you're trying to ask me to connect to. This happens a lot in toxic relationships between parents and child. And it's, you know, this feeling like you did this and it made me feel this way. And there's this gaslighting moment of, well, I didn't do that. And the child is left feeling confused. Well, of course you did. That's the way I felt. And the parent pushes even harder and harder. This is the essential place to put a boundary in. I don't have to accept your behavior. I don't care if your perception of the moment isn't what my perception of the moment is. It's not working for me. With boundaries, this right to protect yourself, you also have to be kind to the self. You deserve love and care. You as a child deserved the same. Even if you didn't receive it, you do need to learn how to practice self-compassion to be able to treat yourself with the same kindness you'd offer to a friend, right? To be kind to yourself, to have self-compassion means that you are okay with all of the first steps that I just gave you. One, being willing to identify that there has been a problem and acknowledging it, sitting in the feelings, challenging these negative beliefs, asking yourself, is it time to have therapy? setting boundaries, being willing to say, I deserve to feel okay. I deserve to actually give myself some love. I deserve to show up for myself and to be kind in a way that I may not have ever known before, but I'm willing to try to figure it out. Self-compassion. When you move through those spaces, you begin to move into a new intentionality, which is to define who you are now as an adult. 
the focus on your strengths, your values, your beliefs, your aspirations, the let go of the labels and the limiting beliefs and these understandings that you are handed over. It's the space where you create a new identity based in authenticity, based in honorable courage, in truth, in sincerity. It's getting into a space where you answer those questions that if you've listened to the podcast so often, I hand over. What do I want? What do I need? How do I want to feel? How will I get there? It's answering those pieces and moving towards them. To create a new identity as an adult means I understand that my past has happened. I can't change it, but I can learn from it. I can take those experiences and create something new. We're not letting go and acting like those things didn't happen. That's whitewashing your experience and that is not what we're doing here. What we want to do is simply say, these are the things that happened in my life and I honor them. They may not have felt good. They may not be what you want, but they are a part of your history, of your story. They made you. They brought you to where you are now and to act like they don't exist is a shame. What we can do is say that happened to me, but I am not that thing. There is a major understanding that must come into place, a major understanding that so many of us fail to remember. And it is this, you do not have to confuse where you are with who you are. Your circumstances don't always match your intentions or what's in your heart. Sometimes your circumstances are so far left of what you actually desire that what's really happening is a roadmap to get into a path that works for you. I see where I've been. I know where I'm going. That's the focus. And from there, when you know that your next step is all on you and it doesn't have to be based on the past, you have to learn when to forgive. This is important. Hear me now. Forgiveness does not mean condoning hurtful behavior. It doesn't mean saying it's okay. It's fine. You didn't mean it. It's not giving a pass of freedom to anyone. What it means is that you're freeing yourself from resentment. Forgiveness is really for you. And when you say, I choose to no longer hold the burden of your pain, I choose to no longer hold your behavior and your actions, I choose to allow myself freedom, that's when forgiveness is at its best. Forgiveness is not for everything. I do want to say that. I do want to say that there are some things in your experience that simply cannot be, there's some great debates on that, right? And why I say that is there are some people who can't ever get to a place of understanding when it comes to certain events. And so having the personal freedom to say there are some things that can't be forgiven is okay. It is. Does it work for you? That's the ultimate question. Does this work for me? There are different levels of forgiveness too. So maybe you can't get to that full top level of it's okay. I have gratitude for the experience, but maybe you can get somewhere in the mid level, whatever it is, forgive when necessary, when it works for you. And remember, forgiveness does not mean condoning so important. It's not a pass. In the healing process, it's also extremely important to build a support network. When we've had a lot of childhood trauma, when there has been really hard experiences, when our dysfunction really has screwed us, we generally don't have a large support network. We generally don't. But we have to learn to bring people into our experience. It is going to therapy. It's joining groups. It's getting yourself out. It's finding the people that you align with. 
It's people that make you feel like you can take your growth and your healing to the next level. So it's seeking out friends or mentors too. Surrounding yourself with positive influences allows you to know that, you know what? I may have been screwed by the behaviors of these people that were, quote, supposed to love me, but I do not have to carry them for the rest of my life. Healing is a process. You have to have strength to break free from all of the chains of the past and all the things that have happened and be willing to do it with a group that actually builds you up instead of tears you down. We've had that enough, right? And that's really the path. That's the beginning stages. Seek support. Find a place that you can acknowledge the impact of what you've experienced. Feel your feelings. Listen to the messengers. Challenge your negative blocks. Seek help set boundaries, find self-compassion, create a new identity, forgive when necessary, and build a support network. Doing that, getting into a space of just acceptance and then forward movement changes absolutely everything. And it is an essential step into getting your life together. Thank you so much for listening to the Get Your Life Together Girl podcast. If you've enjoyed these tips for bettering your life and are seeking daily inspiration, you can follow me on social media at Get Your Life Together Girl on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, Clapper, and now Threads. You can also visit my website at GetYourLifeTogetherGirl.com. There you'll find the show notes, the blog, all kinds of merch and courses. Stick around and check that out. Also, please feel free to send this episode to a family member or friend as it does help spread the message to those who most need it. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, please hit the subscribe button as it no longer automatically downloads. I hope that you have a most beautiful day. Thank you for being an essential part of this community. Until next time, be kind to yourself and others.